Welcome Earth and Space Science students to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. Uh, we wish you could be here with us in person today, um, but since you can't, we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here um, during a virtual field trip experience. Uh, today's our, If you have, are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. And once you get there, you get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just get use this information for our attendance purposes. And today's field trip is going to be all about Earth's history. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that scientific dating methods of fossil and rock sequences are used to construct a chronology of Earth's history expressed in the geologic time scale. Students will explore relative dating methods using original horizontality, rock superposition, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, unconformities, index fossils, and biozones based on fossil succession to determine chronological order. So we're going to start all of that off by exploring original horizontality and rock superposition with Mrs. Fuller. Next, we're going to explore lateral continuity and cross-cutting relationships with Mr. Monroe. Third, we're going to look at unconformities with Ms. Nash. And last but not least, we're going to look at index fossils and biozones with Mr. Mires. While we're doing all of that, uh, you can ask us questions and we encourage you to ask questions. Um, the way you do that is by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And once you get there, you can fill out a very short form to ask us any question you have related to Earth's history. You can ask as many questions as you like, and we'll do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and turn it over to, um, I believe it is Mr. Ramirez or... Me, yeah. It's yes, Mr. Mirrors, Mirrors is going Mr. first um, with original horizont horizontality and rock superposition. Hello, my name is Mr. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be going over uh, horizontal, uh, original horizontality and um, su rock superposition. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, I'm going to share my screen with you guys, and we're going to look at a quick PowerPoint presentation to learn about those vocabulary words. Uh, so let me just start that screen share and uh, start our PowerPoint for you guys. Oops, not share. Oops, I did the wrong one. Uh, present. There we go. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to show you just a super quick little video. And this is just a video of Earth's history in one minute. So as you guys are watching this video, see if you can identify any of the events in the video. And then also think about how do we know these events happened? So as a scientist, what are some methods that we can use to determine the date of events um, or how old fossils are? And again, think about, were you able to identify any of these historical events as well? And I'm just gonna go ahead and stop it right there. So hopefully you guys were able to at least identify some of those historical events, but also be able to think about how do we know they happened? Um, so scientists can use a variety of different ways to date events and objects. So we have historical or written accounts, but we also have fossil evidence. Um, so for example, just to see um, kind of a pre-assessment of where you guys are at, if we take a look at this image over here on the left, uh, which fossil do you think is the oldest, A, B, or C, and then why? So justify your answer. And then why you guys are kind of thinking about that uh, question, question. Uh, this image over here, these are actual fossils that were found here in Texas at Mineral Wells. So if you have an interest in fossil hunting, there is a fossil park in Mineral Wells, Texas. It's not that far away from Dallas. It's open to the public and it's free. Um, so you can actually visit there and see what kind of fossils you can find. And I've actually been there a couple of times and you really do find a whole bunch of cool, interesting fossils like these little crinoids. They look like uh, stems. You can find some shells or bivalves. Uh, shark teeth, a whole bunch of very interesting fossils. 
And if you're interested in that, the website is listed below. It's mineralwellsfossilpark.com. Um, and hopefully you have your answer for which one is, which fossil is the oldest, A, B, or C. Uh, keep that answer in mind as we go through the PowerPoint. Uh, so we're going to be talking about relative dating today. So let's first understand what relative dating is and compare it to absolute dating. So when we talk about relative dating, we're talking about the age of a rock compared to other rocks. So it's a qualitative measure. So for example, uh, an example of relative dating would be this fossil is older than that fossil. So you're just comparing it with another one. Uh, versus absolute dating, which we're not really going to talk about that much for today, but just so you know the difference. Um, absolute dating is giving an actual number of years since that rock was formed. So it's an actual number and it's a quantitative um, data. So for example, if you were to say this fossil is 5 million years old, that would be absolute dating. And y'all probably are familiar with this. Uh, the one that y'all are familiar with for absolute dating would be like carbon dating. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on relative dating methods. And uh, the first two methods that we're going to be exploring today are the principle of hor original horizontality. And so this came about in 1669 by a scientist named uh, Nicolaus Steno. And he essentially came up with this principle. And it's essentially stating that sedimentary rocks are deposited in primarily horizontal beds. Um, so it's essentially a rock layer that is folded. If it's folded or inclined, it must have been moved into that position uh, by crustal disturbances such as mountain building, faults, or plate movement. So by the law of principle of original horizontality, sedimentary rocks are going to be deposited in these horizontal beds. And if they're not horizontal, there's a reason why. Um, so something had to happen to make these uh, strata not horizontal anymore. Now we also, he also came up with something else and that's called the principle of superposition. And that's essentially saying that in an undisturbed sedimentary sequence, the oldest rocks are going to be at the bottom of the stack. So if we look at this diagram here, the oldest rocks are going to be the ones at the bottom. The youngest ones are going to be at the, the ones at the top. So if you remember back to that uh, diagram that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, which one would be the oldest fossil. So hopefully you guys said letter C because according to uh, the principle of superposition, the oldest fossils or rocks are gonna be at the bottom and the youngest will be at the top. Uh, so those are two very easy uh, principles. Again, it's the original horizontality and that's just that rock layers are horizontal. Um, and if they're not horizontal, then that means something must have happened uh, to make them not horizontal. And again, like the mountain building, the faults or the plate movement. And then the principle of superposition, which is just simply stating that the oldest rocks will be at the bottom of the stack. Um, and our next slide. So here's my challenge question for you guys. So if we look at this diagram here, observe what you see, which layer would be the youngest and which one would be the oldest? And I also threw in something in there as well. Uh, so see if you guys can identify which one will be the youngest and which one will be the oldest. In the next segment, you're actually gonna learn about what this uh, piece is right here for number six. So, but go ahead and make your uh, guess as to what you think it is. And then we'll move on to our next slide. And then uh, for our little brain break before my time is up, um, watch this video. This is of a very interesting and cool rock formation in Waco, and it's at Lover's Leap. Oops. It's at Lover's Leap in Cameron Park um, in Waco, Texas. So as you're watching this flyover of this rock formation, uh, be thinking about what you see and notice those horizontal layers. Uh, so I really encourage you guys to take a trip out there. It's just a quick day trip from Dallas. Um, and it's about 20 miles of trails. The Brazos River and the Bosque River actually run through it. And that formation that you're seeing is a limestone bluff. Um, it's a type of Austin chalk. And I've actually been out there before and I've actually found a fossil uh, within some of that uh, rock formation. Uh, so it really is a beautiful sight to see. Um, and the story behind that is that there was a legend that a Na Native American woman named Wawa T, she secretly accepted a marriage proposal from a handsome Apache um, 
and they were from uh, enemy tribes. So they too hoped to run away from each other, but they were caught by the father and their brother. Um, so instead of being apart forever, they decided to leap off the cliff uh, rather than spend a lifetime apart. So that's how it got the name Lover's Leap. Uh, but it really is a very interesting uh, rock formation where you can clearly see the horizontal strata or layers in that formation. Um, so now I'm going to stop the video and we will stop the screen share. And then here's that little false I was telling you guys that I found um, within some of that limestone formation, some sort of like little shell. Uh, but there's very, it is very interesting to see and to study as well. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton. He's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Uh, the question that came in is what kind of a plane did they use for that flyover? And um, I kind of think it might have been a drone actually that they used for that, just judging how the, the camera was changing angles. But it was a I'm drone. Not, oh, well, great. I was not positive about that, but now, now I am. Uh, so now we're going to move on to um, lateral continuity and cross cutting relationships. And you will learn about those dikes um, with Mr. Monroe. Good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be investigating, exploring uh, two dating methods that are called lateral continuity and cross-cut relationships. These two relatively dating methods were used by geologists to date rocks and fossils and to construct chronology of the Earth's history. Now, uh, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you and we're going to take a little imagination in our minds and take a little trip to the southwestern part of the United States. Okay, where is it? Goodness. I th think you need to click share screen first. There you, there you go. And, well, let me move And, and then um, Google Chrome at the bottom. Yep. And uh, open up a new, open up a new tab. Well, I got to move myself again. <laughs> and then over on the right next to that H, click on those nine little dots. No, the, no, the nine, that's the three dots. The, 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 now just to the left of that other H, down. Nope. Uh, oh, I got it. There, there we go. go. And then open up uh, Google Drive. Google Drive. And there, and there we it is. Go. Yep. There you go. And then click present. All right. We're there. What you're looking at, students, is what oh, an example of lateral continuity and cross -cut, cutting relationships. On the left, you see lateral continuity. And basically what that is stating is that the principles of lateral continuity states that layers of sediment initially extend laterally in all directions. In other words, they are laterally continuous. They may cover a very broad area, especially if they form at the bottom of ancient seas. As a result, the rocks that are otherwise similar, but now are separated by a valley or other erosional features will still match up and be, the, be assumed to be the original continuous, okay? What we're going to do is take a little trip through the Southwest part of the United States. And the reason that we've selected, oh, in fact, I will tell you this, you can find examples of these uh, geological forms all over the world, but we have some excellent places to visit in the Southwest part of the United States, because in that area, there is very little vegetation to conceal, uh, conceal uh, the vision of those 
formation. We're going to go ahead and start moving through, starting with the Grand Canyon. And if you look at this, you can tell that the Grand Canyon in, area, in Arizona is a good example of lateral continuity. You can clearly see the same rock layers on the opposite sides of the canyon. The matching rock layers were deposited at the same time. So they are the same age. And we can go a little further and see some other canyons. And it's very apparent that if you were to really look closely at some of these, these layers on the opposite side, you will find matching layers of the same type of rock and soil formations. Same here. Now the next area that we're going to go visit is, well, it's actually still the Grand Canyon, but here we have rock outcrops at Monument Valley in Utah. These are desert red rock buttes and they're quite striking. They're also a representation of a deep history. The principle of lateral continuity recognizes that when you see something like this, when you see rock layers that appear to match across the gap, you can infer that they are originally continuous. You can see the lines so that if you were to interpolate between these rock formations, that rock, what rock used to be there you can see that the layers are continuous across the distance. That's because all of the rocks was continuous at one time, but over the years, parts of it has eroded away. Now we're gonna talk about cross-cutting relationships. And Ms. Ramirez had an example of that in one of her uh, uh, presentations there, rock layers may have another rock layer or other rocks cutting across them. Which rock is older? To determine this, we use another important geological principle called cross-cutting relationships, a technique used in a relatively aged dating. In short, an intrusive rock body is younger than the rocks that it is intruded upon as shown in this diagram. Now, the next place that we're going to visit is a perfect example of cross-cut relationship. Now, a diabase igneous rock, which we see right here, it's an intrusion of, and this is located at Hanson Rapid on the Colorado River. These cross-cuts cross -cut, are made up of shale. This is also found at the Grand Canyon National Park. Here we have another example, pegmatite, pig, peg, pegmatite, which is another type of igneous rock exposed in the painted wall cliff face. The light colored rock is younger than the dark colored rock. This is uh, the Black Canyon of Gunnison National Park Colorado. The last one that I'm going to show you is, or no, it's not the last one, but this is a classic dike in a, is a seam of sedimentary material that fills an open fracture in and cuts across sedimentary rock strata or layering in, a, in other rock types. Plastic dikes form rapidly when fluidized injection or Pour in fluids or loose sediment passively by water, wind, and gravity, and it is swept into the cracks to fill the cracks. And we can see that this is what it looks like. And if you look over here, you can see it extends all the way up to the very top of that peak. The last one that I'm going to show you is this one. Vertically sheeted classic dike typo, typical of those found in rhythmic bedded Missoula flood slack water deposits of the Columbian, Columbia Basin. We have showing as a scale, a uh, yellow field book that is found right here. 
You can see that. This was a, a picture that was taken of this formation in Willow Creek Valley in Oregon. So hopefully you've got a pretty good understanding about lateral continuity and cross-cutting relationships and how they can be used to date material. Now, those intrusions, one must remember, they would actually be the young. And as far as uh, looking back at lateral continuity, the erosion agents, such as a river cutting through the Grand Canyon, that river or whatever separated those formations would be considered to be the youngest. Hopefully you've learned a little bit with me today. And uh, guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of your virtual field trip. And I want you guys to have a very good day. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton. And uh, if you have any questions, hopefully he'll be able to answer those questions for you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Broughton. Yep, thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, the question that came up was, um, are those are is like lateral continuity and um, the the uh, cross cutting relationships um, only found in the Western United States? Uh, no, they are found all over the world. Um, Mr. Monroe just decided to focus on the Western United States because we do have a limited time, and if we spent, um, I mean, we could spend days looking at all the formations all over the world, but we just don't have that kind of time. All right, now we're going to move on to unconformities with Miss Nash. Hello. So today we're talking about unconformities. Okay, so you may have heard a word called someone referred to as being a nonconformist. So that person is a real nonconformist. That means they don't go along with everyone else. They have their own ideas. And unconformities in geology are things that occur that are very puzzling because they don't go along with the rules we talked about before, right? the superposition, et cetera. So we're gonna look at a few examples and there's some amazing ones out there. These are some really cool um, formations, I think. So let's see if we can see them here. Unconformities, here we go. Now, so again, unconformities are things that are somehow different than what we would expect. Means that don't go along with our regular rules. So as we know, the crust is constantly changing through uplift, subsidence, deformation, erosion, deposition, etc. When sediment is not being deposited or when erosion removes previously deposited sediment, the record in the rocks will show a break. In some cases, this break can be billions of years maybe millions, but billions of years of missing rock. The evidence in the stratigraphic record is called an unconformity. And there are three kinds, an angular unconformity, my favorite, the nonconformity and the disconformity. So we're gonna look at examples of all three. So Mr. Monroe showed you some pictures of the Grand Canyon and it's a great place to explore because you can see all those things in one place. So you can float down the river on a raft like I've done a couple of times, amazing, and you can just see all these things. And the, the guys get all excited when you get to the site of the great nonconformity where billions of years of geological history are missing. So there's that Grand Canyon again, and it's truly an amazing place. Okay. You can hike down into it also but floating down the river is the way to go, really. But unconformities were first described by a, a, Scot, a Scottish scientist named James Hutton in the 1700s on the coast of Scotland. And he was looking at rocks and he theorized that these layers that were not horizontal anymore, um, something had happened. Somehow they had been tilted up. And probably this, in this case, it was probably tectonic plate moving. So this is his way of figuring out about deep time, okay, um, other forces, the tectonic plates. I mean, this was a revolutionary moment in, the, in geological theorizing. Okay. So here's some more pictures of that Sikar point in, on the north coast of Scotland and the pilgrimage plate. So geologists from all over the world go there to look and see what, um, James Hutton was thinking about. 
So these are some, these are the easiest kind of unconformity to recognize because they are pretty spectacular. Look at these. I mean, it's so cool. You see how they've been tilted and bent all around, over and over. So they were horizontal. They were flat, one on top of the other, and then bad things happened. Here's another good example. Okay. The tilting. So other kinds of, of unconformities are harder to recognize. So these, dis, these are called disconformities and they're revealed by more subtle irregularities. So basically something happened and the, the strata was either missing or, or somehow deformed. So the missing strata was to have been removed by erosion. So they eroded, they, they came up from where they were being deposited, they wrote it off and then they've subsided and then more deposition took place on top of them. Here's some other examples this fellow I'm showing you. See how that, there's that dip there? So that's an example. This is Utah, which has a lot of great rock formation and canyons, Bryce Canyon. This is the missing billion years, okay? The famous missing billion. So these are the non-conformities. And what happens here is that rock formed deep in the surface. So the, those igneous rocks or metamorphic rocks come up and then they're overlain by the sedimentary rock. And the non-conformity can only occur when those rocks overlaying it have been removed by erosion and then subsequently replaced. Okay. Here's some more just kind of random pictures of some interesting things. And when you go out next time on a road trip, you're driving along to a road cut, you can look for, look for some of these things, okay? They're out there in the hill country or way out in West Texas here, not so much. But if you just go west of here and out to the hill country or out to Big Bend, okay, or even out just up to the Panhandle, you can see some of these things on the road. So it's a pretty interesting thing to drive around and say, oh, look, that's what they were talking about in my geology class. Okay. So thank you. And um, I'm gonna let you go back to answer any questions. Mr. Broughton will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. The question that came in is where are these non-conformities found? And like the lateral continuity and um, cross-cutting relationships, they are found all over the world because um, geology is happening all over the world. All right, now we're going to look at uh, index fossils and biozones with Mrs. Fuller. Hi, boys and girls. We're gonna be talking about biozones and index fossils. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. And here we go. And gotta move this. All right. So biozones and index fossils. So look at that fossil right there. That's probably the most famous marine fossil in the world. It's a trilobite. Well, how old is it? And how do we know how old it is? Well, for one thing, we've got things called biozones, which is a stratigra stratigra stratigraphic unit consisting of all the strata. All the strata is is a layer. So of all the layers containing a particular fossil, and because of that, uh, it was deposited during its ex existence. So look at this layer right here. So you see this orange one, it's got an ammonite and a crinoid in it right there. Well, this could be in North America, and this could be in Africa, and this could be on the European continent. And it's the same strata, the same layer, the same biozone with the same biota, with the same uh, living things. So let's see, move this over here, it is, okay. And I need to go to my next slide. 
and most index fossils, we're going to talk about index fossils now. Uh, index fossils are any animal or plant preserved in the rock record of the earth and uh, that's uh, characteristic of a particular span of geologic time or environment. So most index fossils are marine fossils. It's really easy for things that die in the ocean to be fossilized because they get covered with sediment right away. And if they have hard parts like teeth or shells or uh, claws or um, skeletons that can uh, be fossilized. So most strata, most layers uh, that contain fossils are of marine origin. Now, this is a shot of uh, a little wall in a park. Uh, it's called Trinidad State Park. It's real near Trinidad, Colorado. If you look up here in the middle part underneath this big limestone wedge here, you'll see a, a line of white. That is the designation or that is the line that separates the Cretaceous down here from the Paleogene up here. It used to be called the KT boundary. A lot of you that are fossil uh, dinosaur fans know about the KT boundary. Well, they don't actually call it the KT boundary anymore. Now they call it the K uh, slash PG boundary. The PG stands for Paleogene. And uh, what we have here is we have a sharp, uh, line drawn in between the Cretaceous and the, um, and the uh, um, Paleogene above. And there is a, a mineral embedded in that called iridium. Iridium is not real common on earth, but it is common in meteors. And uh, as you know, um, there was a big uh, extinction event 66 million years ago when an asteroid hit off the coast of uh, Mexico and it had a lot of iridium in it apparently and it was deposited all over the world so uh, anything that was extinct during uh, that time um, it's not going to be found above that layer that KPG boundary so what's a what's a good index fossil well a good index fossils are fossils that have these characteristics. It is distinctive. It's globally widespread. It's abundant. It's limited to a particular geologic time and it's robust and preserves well. So even if it's real indicative of a particular time, if it doesn't fossilize well, we won't have enough of them to see. Now, um, you might say, well, I mean, like, why would things appear here and not appear there? Well, we've had six uh, extinction events in the 4.6 billion years we've been here. And um, I'm going to just briefly touch on them. Then I'm going to show you a bunch of index fossils. So the first one, uh, uh, well, let me just show you the slides. First one's at Ordovici and Silurian. That was 440 million years ago. And it was caused by rapid cooling of the earth. The oceans became toxic. 85% of all species disappeared. But there are some index fossils from this period, trilobites, conodonts, that's a kind of eel, and brachiopods. And I'm gonna show you a trilobite and a brachiopod in a minute. Okay, uh, the late Devonian, uh, this was caused by the oxygen levels uh, plunging because of um, volcanism. And, um, and also they think there was a, a asteroid hit, here, uh, hit also that added to this because there was a big crater in Sweden. Uh, it eliminated 75% of all species, but over a 200, over 20 million year span. This one didn't happen real fast like the one in Mexico. And the index fossils for here would be tetrapods, trilobites, and spire bearing brachiopods. Then we have this one. This is granddaddy of them all, the Permian Triassic extinction event. This was called by uh, volcanic eruptions in Siberia. It's called the Great Dying. Uh, like 96% of all marine species disappeared and three out of four terrestrial species. And index fossils for this period would be brachiopods, fusilinids, and ammonoids, Triassic, Jurassic. This is a warming of the earth. 80% of all the species died out. And I've got a bunch of pictures down there of fusilinids, which are foraminifera. 
And then we've got this uh, Cretaceous Paleogene one. And this is when an asteroid uh, hit the coast of the Yucatan and 76% of all species went extinct, including the dinosaurs, except the non-bird uh, dinosaurs. Uh, no, uh, all the dinosaurs except the bird dinosaurs. Uh, index fossils are ammonites and nano fossils. And nano fossils are the fossils most heavily used as index fossils because they mutated rapidly and were widespread. And examples of that would be foraminifera and radiolarians. So uh, let's get out of this and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna show you real quickly some, some of these uh, index fossils I was talking about. Now let's talk about shark teeth. I know many of you have been out here to look for shark teeth in our uh, Eagle Ford Shale, which is Pennsylvanian. No, it's uh, Cretaceous. So it's about 125 million years old. Our shark teeth are real tiny out here. We'll look at this one. This one's from 100 million years ago. And I'm gonna have to read you this guy's name. His name is Odotus Oblicus. This is the ancestor to Megalodon. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a Megalodon uh, fossil, but I do have a cast. That's how big that guy's uh, teeth were. He was really big. It's probably the biggest uh, marine predator that we've ever had. He was huge. He was all over the world. With, and these fossils are common. And the reason why they're common is sharks shed about 40,000 teeth over the course of their lifetime. So we've got them on the east coast of the US, we've got them off the coast of Morocco, they're all over the world. It's a really cool thing. Okay, now let's look at another one, trilobites. I know when I was talking about index fossils, this is another cast. This isn't a real fossil. Uh, they got real big. Now I've never found a big uh, big one. Uh, the little, um, um, borrow pit out at Mineral Wells where, where Miss Ramirez told you you can get all that uh, Pennsylvanian era uh, uh, marine fossils. They have tiny little trilobites, not great big fancy ones like this. I'm gonna show you a real one. This guy came from Morocco. Look at that, isn't that something? And that's a real fossil, that's not a cast. So trilobites live for a long time, but it, the, the Permian extinction, the granddaddy of them all, um, they went extinct. So, uh, and there was a lot of variety in them. So it, it really makes a good index fossil. Another good index fossil we have right here. Now, I live in Dallas. I live in the Oak Cliff part of Dallas. And we've got a lot of Austin chalk. And there's an ammonoid right there. Here's a part of one that's a lot bigger. You can see the outside of, of the, uh, the rim of the ammonoid. And here's one that's not preserved with calcium carbonate, but is actually preserved with agate. Isn't that gorgeous? These guys were in the seas all over the earth. There's a huge variety in them. They're extinct. They went extinct during the granddaddy of them all extinction event. So uh, they're great. Um, index fossils. So now I'm gonna show you a couple of more. These are from Texas. These are from uh, Brown County. This is a, a rugosa. It's a type of horn coral. And um, it looks like a horn, like the horn on a goat. And uh, here are a couple more examples of that. And these guys went uh, extinct at the end of Permian also. And uh, let me show you now. These guys are called crinoids. And you probably maybe have seen these. They're all over the place in Texas, all over central Texas and road cuts. Guess what? We still have crinoids today. And uh, they're a conoderm and they're, they can either be sessile or mobile. They're very interesting animals. So um, if you have any more questions about index fossils and how that they can help us uh, determine um, how old something is, one more I have to mention before I go. Th this is foraminifera. I do have some foraminifera to show you. These are called wheat forams. They look all the world to be little grains of wheat. That's a one-celled animal, believe it or not. And they're still alive today. 
Most of them died out at the Permian extinction, but we still have them. They're heavily used in Texas in the oil and gas industry to determine how old strata is. So they drill down, get a core, look at it and find these little guys. They're all different shapes. They're, there's a huge variety in them and uh, they're fascinating animals also. So um, if you're uh, interested in this, geology is a great profession and there's a lot of a need for that in the oil and gas industry. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Mr. Broughton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. I'm gonna share my screen here and do a quick recap of what we uh, did today. So today's field trip was titled Earth's History. During this virtual field trip, students discovered that scientific dating methods of fossils and rock sequences are used to construct a chronology of Earth's history expressed to the geologic time scale. Students explored relative dating methods using original horizontality, rock superposition, lateral continuity, cross-cutting relationships, unconformities, index fossils, and biozones based on fossil succession to determine chronological order. So first we saw Mr. Ramirez. Um, explore and explain original horizontality and rock superposition. Next, we explored lateral continuity and cross-cutting relationships with Mr. Monroe. Third, we explored unconformities with Ms. Nash. And then we just learned about index fossils and biozones with Mrs. Fuller. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about Earth's history with us. We'd like to know what you think about uh, today's field trip and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. Uh, we hope to see you again for our next field trip for Earth and Space Science students. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.